Okay. So we can do this. Hey, some tea. Put some sugar. Sometimes I use maple syrup, but I don't use sugar this time. This is like, like say brown sugar. All brown sugar is is white sugar with caramel on it. You know, I put two in there. Oh, I got One of the things, my I used to drink tea in the mornings. Sometimes my grandmother would have coffee, but she would make me tea. And uh, one of the things she taught me making tea, this is what's that fancy tea? Like you had, you used to have a tea bag, you know, like with a Lipton flow through tea bag. And she would taught me that what you do, you know, because we had a saucer down there which I don't have. I should. You wrap the thing around at one time, and then you you squeeze like that to get excess out. You see? This is that fancy see, I think it's that black chai. Let me put that right there. Oh, I also got a moringa in here. I can't do the same thing with moringa. This tea is hot too. This is my moringa. Let me put that down there too, get rid of that. Oof. Eef. Hot now. Stir in two things of sugar. That's fun. Hey, as folks may or may not know, I'll listen to this channel, but I, I won't go through the whole thing. It's something else. We're going to talk about three three plays. Because I'm a theater person. And the first play we're going to do it backwards. These are plays of the 60s. I'm saying plays of the 60s because they all appear in the conscious in the 60s. One you never heard of. One you never heard of. That's the last one. This, this, this play was uh, done. In uh, yeah, the summer of 1969, <coughs> at the uh, uh, New York City Mission Society Cadet Corps uh, summer program, you know, uh, it's that program where they put uh, it's like Cadet Corps, you know, it's the Cadet Corps, like like you remember as the Boy Scouts or whatever, you Cubbies or whatever it is, you know, and uh, and they they have put a a, a unit, you know, you know, Company A, Company B, Company C, you know, whatever, Company D. I think we're Company D. It was you know, the kiddies. They put all of <laughs> And then he had like three platoons and the thing, whatever. But they created one platoon, one squad, whatever we called it at that time. And they took all of these are like eight and nine year olds. Yeah, eight and nine year olds? It's supposed to be nine years. I think some sort of cutoff. We also had seven year olds in there. Well, you know. Anyway, so they put all the troublemakers together in one platoon. One platoon. And here's my here's my interpretation. I don't know if this really happened, but they must have had a meeting. Cause they, see, all of her, all of her, all of the leaders they know us since we were very young. Since we were nine years old, basically, friend came to the cadet corps. And so, anyway, you know, a bunch of things: fraternity, officers training school, whatever have you. Now with that, I think a year after I had got, uh, anyway, got just a bunch of awards and stuff like that. So here's my thing. They said, "Wow, now we got all these crazy kids together. Who are we gonna put in charge?" Man, I think they had a collective. Everybody looked at each other at the same time. They didn't have a choice. Sloan. <laughs> so they put me in charge of this thing. So these, of these, all of all the, all the so-called, you know, all the bad, the troublemakers, you know, the, the, the crazy, the, 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 all that thing, right? And um, I think John Lloyd and, and, and Sam Paul was, was was my assistants, or whatever, next in command. And then Vincent Trotman was the um, was the guy, was was the our company commander. I remember one thing Vincent said. I think I always I remember this to this day. He said, "He was just standing out there, and I repeat this a lot. He's standing out there. He said, Anthony, you know Harlem. Harlem doesn't need any social workers. Harlem needs psychologists. That's what he says. All he said. He used Harlem as a metaphor. Black people don't need social workers or whatever. They're trying to give us politics. But we need people to change our minds. That's what they need. Anyway, so let me jump to everything now." Well, if you want to change somebody's mind, you got to get into their mind to change them. Now, you can tell them something from a book or whatever, have you? But you have to get into their mind. So, how, what's the best way to do it, or a soft way to do it? Well, of course, through arts, you know, through your your, um, your songs, you know, your dances, you know, whatever. Well, I'm a I'm a play. I'm a theater person. Okay. And uh, at the time, uh, I, I've been at the Negro Ensemble Company for about a year and a half, something like that. Uh, you know, professionally trained, did a company at the time. I was young. Um, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, she uh, 
she was she really coming out of Negro or something. But anyway, she wrote a play, you know, so we did a little skit. So we did this as one of the, you know, because we have these assemblies, you know, all the companies come together, sit in Victoria, and then we, we present stuff. So my, my group, we had to present So She gave me this play to present. Okay. I look at the play, I'm looking at, oh, okay, fine, fine. You know, now I should say something about, about this woman, my girlfriend at the time. We both existed, because uh, I was going to Bronx Community College at the time. We both existed in this group, uh, it's a, it's a, this little uh, study group, you know, that was, uh, that, I don't even know we had a name, but it was three men, uh, three girls, three boys, I'm saying boys because we're young, three girls, boys, and it was headed by Bobby and Billy Shepard, the two, these two guys that had been to Vietnam. So they told us all the stuff about Vietnam, about the political, everything, and plus people we reading it, like, you know, reading, reading the Fumba, you know, reading, you know, Mao, reading Che, you know, we, we, we you know, we got that Fanon, you know, we, uh, that was, we was the study group. And we was the study group for the, for a bigger group, the group called Simba, that, for Bronx, Bronx Community College, Simba. And so we were like the, 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 the think tank, you know, for the organization, you know. So like the head of the organization was Horace, some, this guy uh, from the Caribbean. So he was the, he was the head. So we, anyway, so we, we fed them information. I just wanted to say, so, so what I'm trying to say, we, I existed in a little group that we were, before this, the, the, the women didn't go out and get coffee and like, we were just studying. That's what we, that's what we did. In fact, I won't get into that, that's too personal. Anyway, so she gives us play and so, so she wasn't at the rehearsal or nothing like that, like that, but she was at the performance. So we did the play. Well, after the play, she just laid into me. Oh, I, I did. I'm calling up, but I didn't change. I didn't do anything. I didn't change one word. I, what was it? This is my trauma. As the first time as a director, I should say. He said, but you changed my, and I didn't change your ending. He said because it was a whole thing about this lab and this white rat, right? And and and, and the white rat at the end. She, I think she, she lets it, they, they, right, right, remember this is a high black power time, you know what I mean, 69. So, so I let the, so she let the rat go free, right, in the play, she lets the rat go free, it's not safe. I, I basically flushed the, I changed, not changed, well, she, but look, she let it go free. I flushed it down the toilet, I mean, as a director, I we flushed it down the toilet. I said, because there was no written, there was no, I guess there was something. No, it was not, I didn't change any words. I just flushed it, just made it, just flushed it down the toilet, made the toilet sound, whatever happened. Well, that's what she was upset me about. Because she said she wanted the white rat to live. It's a metaphor, man, really, like the white people to live. And I go, and so immediately, because I'm quick, I used to be real quicker than this, but I said, well, I didn't kill it. I just flush it down the toilet. It could get away. It can. It, it will live. It just won't live in our, in our, you know, near our laboratory. We know we flush it way, way far away. Lordy be man. So anyway, that's. It was traumatic, right? So I tell you about that play only because, you know, here we are in the same cell. Da, 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 but her, her thing was, you know, let the white people go. You know, my thing is that I'll let them go, but they got to go through something to, to, to and got to get them far away from me as possible. That was my mentality. Hers was something different. Okay. So let's go to another play. Then in uh, about 1986, I, there was some time, 86, 88, maybe it was 88, somewhere around there in New York, there was this whole thing, uh, Al Sharpton called this Day of Absence. Called, it was uh, called that, a for, he called for a Day of Absence in New York where people wouldn't go to work, whatever happened. Now, I'm a theater person, plus I was thinking about summer coming, so I know Doug, I know, Doug, you know, Doug was turned aboard. And one of his plays is a thing called Day of Absence, you know. So I'm thinking, you know, um, that, well, people don't actually know what a day of absence is. They don't really know what it is, but this play perfectly shows what it is. So I, I made it to the station. Uh, I was at WBA. I was at 505 8th Avenue at the time. And I, it was my first, actually, well, we did a live one uh, a couple of, like a, a week before at night, you know, the eve of Christmas Eve, something like that with Creative Unity, uh, my core group. Um, well, then this was came right on right on the heels of that. And uh, so, so Day of Absence is basically about, the, about this small southern town where the black people all of a sudden disappear. It's just white people, they got to cope, you know? Okay, so that's what the play was about. So I, what I did was I looked at the piece and I said, oh, this is perfect, I don't have to change anything. And so I did not change one word, but what I did change was the characterizations. So for instance, we, say Yusef could do all these voices, you know, you could do Eddie Murphy and he could do, um, he could do uh, uh, Mayor Koch at the time. It was Mayor Koch, a bunch of Ronald Reagan, all, and 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 Michael Mayberg. He's he's doing my core group, 
I'm sorry, about eight of them. So I, I made it so the whole station, um, I got the whole back of the station, the main control room, main locker, the air conditioning room, the other studio. I had them all so that basically, I, when I'm doing audio drama at the station, I used to do it like, I, um, like if you look at a, a set, you know, when you're looking at a play, the you know, lights will come up, you know, in this section, that, that would be, say, the backyard. Lights would come up here, that would be the upper bedroom. The lights would come here, that would be the kitchen, that would be the living room. You see how, like that. So you just use the lights and people just see what's going on. Well, I just use each studio as just put up on, 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 on that BB, I guess, was in, as, as, the, as the main control room, instead of the main control room. I would just put up the... The, uh, the microphones for that room, and they would act in that room. We still was old for telephones in each room. You know, we'd say, hey, you ready, 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 Shh, sh, or Somehow we, we monitor it. So it worked out really, really well. But here's what I did. The only thing I really, I mean, I did, like the mayor of the town, I, it's like I said, he played Ed, Ed Koch voice. And there was other people involved. But the biggest thing in Doug's play, um, he put a stereotype in there, step and fetch stereotype, the old, so at the end of the play, this old black guy comes in, hey, this boy's in them, the boy, the people, where, where, where have you been all day? Blah, 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 blah. Well, I don't know, boss. You know how to step and fetch it. Well, you don't know how to step and fetch it, but you know. He was very famous at the time. He had, he had the most money, more money than a whole bunch of other people. You know what I mean? He had Cadillacs and all the rest of the big cars and whatever. And so, and so the only thing I changed, but I said, no, I figured that, well, Doug, when he wrote this play in the, in the early 60s, late 50s, whenever it was, Step and Fetch, it was the stereotype that everybody wanted to stay away from, you see? So I just thought about it. I said, hey, what, what's the what? I can't use step and fetch it when I didn't want to use step and fetch it because it's such a stereotype. I said, what's the what's the thing of the day? And it's, to me, the stereotype was Eddie Murphy, you know, when he's a, the whole Eddie Murphy. So I just had use that effect Eddie Murphy. And so it didn't change a word like that. So he's talking like Eddie Murphy. Thing. It was great. It was wonderful. So I did so I didn't change the play, you know. I didn't change anything. Uh, we got it out there. It was broadcast in New York. Actually, it was the middle of the day. I think it was uh, noon or something. Whenever we, we broadcast it, it only took an hour, less than an hour. And uh, and uh, people learned a lot because they learned how I do audio drama. Because station had never been involved like that. Where all all of the, the, they never did an audio drama like that. So, and it was live. Okay, so we did. So that was done. Okay, so let me leave that alone. So you see where I'm going now? So, so, so you can use, um, um, well, I use plays and, and, and other forms I mean, to advance your cause. So right now with ADS movement especially, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, where are the poets, where are the actors, whatever have you. You have all these guys in Hollywood doing these little skits on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the YouTube, I mean, it's funny these plays, little play skits. Well, hey, let's do some ADOS content and that stuff. You know, let's, let's you know, you know. first remember go to ADOS101.com before you start trying to incorporate things that you don't know anything about. You know, to so do that. Okay, last last play, last thing I want to talk about. Now, this is really interesting. I've written a lot of stuff in my life. I wanted, but acknowledged by, well, one of the best things I ever wrote was about, was the eulogy for my grandmother. My grandmother's huge. I delivered it and whatever I have it. That was a whole hilarious thing, not hilarious kind of thing. But the, pr the preacher, when I finished doing the eulogy, the preacher just, who didn't know my grandmother at all, he just came and said, well, I, I guess everything's been said and he went to some uh, liturgy because he was supposed to say something, but he don't, you know, whatever. But anyway, so, so was eulogy. Now, one of the things I point out is that it's kind of interesting because um, right after I finished undergrad work, I went to uh, um, graduate school for playwriting, right? And one of the plays was they have to do this, the rain hand raised, raising in the sun, which I knew the play, of course. And so I had made the argument about about the about the piece, you know, because you had to do a good critique on whatever have you. And said, I just didn't understand why she had to leave her community and move out there. I guess they were going to Long Island, wherever they moved, wherever they were, living from the ghetto to upward mobility. And I'm saying, I'm going like, well, why didn't she just stay where she was to build up the building, build up that, build up that community? That was my, you know, as a graduate student, you know, some sort of weird, you know, not well, you know, critique of the piece. Unbeknownst to me, about about the same time, relatively, my grandmother was in a, was with a, a, a senior citizen. She, we lived over the Patterson Center. And, and the, the Patterson Center was, it was a center, you know, a recreation center. And so the senior citizens would meet there in, in the middle of the day. And, she, and, and one time I'd come home, I was talking to her, you know, because, you know, I would see her every Sunday, we'd, you know, do this whole, in the morning, well, we do this whole thing, and uh, and uh, we we started with the, um, you know, we started with the, um, the the Catholic Hour on TV, right, and ended up listening to Gil Noble, 
I was shocked. My grandmother was like into Gil Noble and all the stuff he was saying. Now, you know, Gil Noble was informed, uh, really, Gil Noble was informed by Alambe Breath. And that's why that program was so dynamic, because Alambe was giving him a lot of the other stuff in the near front. You better get this now. But my grandmother said something interesting. She said, she said, you know, I was, and she always complains, you know, I was talking to my senior citizen group, and they did, they were just fighting me all the way. I wanted to know why did she have to leave the, 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 uh, the tenement she was in and move away? I'm going to my brain go, whoa. Now my grandmother didn't go past the eighth grade, you know what I mean? Here I am, you know, whatever, going for my master's or whatever it is. And, and we have the same mind. So it was really interesting because when I, in my travels, all my travels, I realized any place in the world, no one is smarter than anybody else. You, you may be in a different system, which make, that system might try to make you look stupid or whatever have you, or they put you at the bottom of the system, whatever, you know what I mean? But in every place, every, almost every corner of the world, you can find your doppelganger. You can find your same mentality. You can find your people. And right now, what, what it was helpful to me is that so many things are being spread up at the same time all over the world. So I just wanted to tell you that because things are related and ADOS is on the move. This is a blue report for me. T from the baddest of taking the trains to bed. Drink my tea. Letting you know what I only suspect from a desk of the ADOS, American Descendants of Chattel Slavery.